the devotees, our humble obeisances, all glories to Sri Prabhupada, all glories to our dear Guru Maharaj, and all glories to the online devotees. Hare Krishna Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So our schedule for today, this afternoon, is going to be by Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, and he will be talking about faith, fact, and fearlessness in our devotional practice. So, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we have some house rules, as always. Our first house rule is please keep your microphone on mute. Also, please switch off your cameras. And questions, if there's any questions at the end of the session, please can you kindly, this time, forward them to Asha Mataji, who will then collate your questions and we can present them to Bhutha Bhavana Prabhu at the end of his session. Also, uh, the other thing is, I hope devotees have rested well. We've had a wonderful session by His Holiness Chandamuli Swami this morning. Hope you've had some prasadam and are energetic to start our next session with Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. On that cue, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, take it away. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll say prayers and then we'll, uh, we'll begin the discussion. Okay. Okay. Sri Chaitanya Manobish Dham Stapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam, Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Utapa de Kamalam Sri Guru and Vaishnavamscha, Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tuam Sajivam, Sadvaitam Savadutam Purjana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita, Sri Vishikam Vitamscha. He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatvate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavanishri Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Pri Vanchika Putrubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyeva Chapadit Nampava Nibhyo Vaishna Vibhyo Namona Maha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhnityananda Sri Advaita Gada Dara Sri Vasadi Gaurabhata Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so we're speaking um, this afternoon on this topic of qualifications of pure devotional service. So what we talk about here is adhika, and this word adhika, it literally means qualification. So we're looking at faith, fact, and fearlessness. Meaning, we're going to look at the three types of devotees, what their symptoms are, and we're also going to discuss why it's important to understand these different things. Um, so let's start with this point. Let's read actually by Rupa Goswami. We're also going to reference from the Nectar of Instruction by Rupa Goswami, and well, by Prabhupada, who is giving an, his, his commentary on Rupa, um, Rupa Goswami's Upadeshamrita. Okay, so I'm just going to begin by reading something from page 58. This is in the purple, a statement by Prabhupada, and then we're going to get into it a bit more. Okay, so Rupa Goswami advises the devotee to be intelligent enough to distinguish between the Kanishta Adhikari, Madhyam Adhikari, and Uttama Adhikari. The devotee should also know his own position and should not try to imitate a devotee situated on a higher platform. So... The first point here is that evaluation is absolutely essential. Um, again, connecting with what we discussed before, there are many things that are part of the tradition of bhakti, which, which are often in antithesis or which are often against some of the, the ways that people think and interact in the modern world. And one of them is this idea of evaluation. So many of us will have heard this idea of devotees or people should not be judgmental. And of course, if by judgment we mean fault finding, if by judgment we mean lording it over people, if by judgment we mean being condescending, then that is absolutely correct because that, that aligns with our tradition. But there's another understanding of judgment. 
and sometimes I remember Bhakti Tittamaraj saying that oftentimes in the new age groups, they have this idea of non-judgmental, but what they really mean is you shouldn't evaluate. So in our tradition, we, we talk about the importance of healthy evaluation. And even though it has been misapplied in many times in modern culture, it's always a feature of reality. So whether we do it consciously or unconsciously, there's always some evaluation going on. When the evaluation is done properly and is done with a compassionate nature, it leads to positive outcomes. When the evaluation is done in the lower modes, it leads to negative outcomes. So to give an example, if you come across someone who is in a, um, in a more needy situation compared to you, and you're, let's say, yeah, let's say they're less capable. Let's just take that as an example. When we come across someone in a situation and we evaluate that they are less capable in some way, they are more needy in a certain way. If the, if the person who's making the evaluation is in the mode of ignorance, the response they make to that person, excuse me, is one of maybe neglect, or it may be to um, mistreat that person. So there's a difference in qualification, but because the person who's seeing it is in the mode of ignorance, they respond by neglect or mistreatment. Now, let's say another person comes along and they evaluate the same person and they reach the same conclusion. The conclusion is that this person is in a less capable state, but that person is in the mode of passion who's, who's making the evaluation. So they can conclude, okay, so that means I can exploit the person or I can manipulate the person. So in ignorance, I may neglect or mistreat. In passion, I may exploit or manipulate. Now let's look at the third example. A person comes along again, they perceive the same person, they evaluate, they recognize this person is, is in some need, but the person who's making the evaluation is in the mode of goodness. So when we are in the mode of goodness and we make an evaluation and we see that someone is in a position of need and we can help, then naturally the response is to support and assist. So evaluation is always there. Sometimes in modern society, we will throw out the baby with the bathwater. So we'll say that because people have mistreated others on the basis of making a judgment, we should not judge or we should not make evaluations. But actually our tradition says something different. It says that there will naturally be differences, just like you have a mother and a child. If the mother considers that she's on the same level of the child, then the child will actually miss out. The child will actually be neglected. So it's a question of not make, the issue isn't making evaluation. The issue is how we respond in a healthy and compassionate way to healthy evaluation based upon the scriptures. So that's the first point. So this sense of evaluation is absolutely um, essential and it should be done, but it should be done with proper compassion. It should be based upon proper knowledge. Because when there's proper knowledge that we're using to evaluate, and when we have a compassionate nature, that means the intention is good, then there will always be healthy and uplifting outcomes. And this is also a natural understanding that we all have. There are many things that we don't think are relative. There are many things that we don't think are just our opinion. Let's say that you have a child and your child is being mistreated by someone then you wouldn't say that I feel that the child's being mistreated. Well, that's just my opinion. But the person who's mistreating them, they may think they're behaving well. That's just their opinion. So everything is equal. There are some things that we intuitively feel are wrong. And that level of evaluation and that differentiation is natural. It's natural because it, it's there in a very, very deep sense in our, in our tradition. And it's, it's a feature of reality. Even the idea of hierarchy is a feature of reality. It's just that hierarchy has been misused so much that now people think that's better to have no hierarchy, but actually the better thing, the best outcome is to have hierarchy that's based upon real qualification and real compassion. So when we talk about this, we're gonna get into the, um, the ways in which we evaluate the different qualifications of different devotees. 
Now, qualifications are based on many things. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about two things in particular. So we call this presentation Faith, Fact, Fearlessness, Qualifications for Pure Devotional Service. And, and we'll explain why we have that title. See, when there is proper faith, that means that faith is based upon proper fact. It's based upon the absolute truth. Those two ingredients coming together, they lead to a certain outcome, and that outcome is fearlessness. So we're going to explain how that whole process works in relation to some of the statements given by Prabhupada in the Nectar of Instruction. So we're going to start with page 56. So on page 56, we're going to read Prabhupada as he explains about Shraddha. Okay. So first of all, he gives this quote. This is from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Matthew Leela, chapter 22, text number 62. Uh, let's see. Actually, no, we'll go back a step. So this, let's read first from Matthew Leela, chapter 22, text number 64. One becomes qualified as a devotee on the elementary, level, on the elementary platform, the intermediate platform, and the highest platform of devotional service according to the development of his shraddha, faith. Then Prabhupada will quote the same chapter, chapter 22, Madhya Leela, text number 62, and this is a translation. He says, by rendering transcendental service to Krishna, one automatically performs all subsidiary activities. Then in the purple, Prabhupada goes on to explain, this confident, firm faith, favorable to the discharge of devotional service, is called Shraddha. Shraddha, faith in Krishna, is the beginning of Krishna consciousness. Faith means strong faith. The words of Bhagavad Gita are authoritative instructions for faithful men. And whatever Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita is to be accepted as it is without interpretation. So Prabhupada is beginning by giving us a very clear idea of what it means to have faith and what faith actually is. Now it's very interesting. The word faith Shraddha, but there's two parts. The first part, the prefix shrad, it comes from the Sanskrit word hrid, the prefix rid, as in radaya, which literally means the heart. And the last part of the word in Sanskrit relates to this idea of shelter. So literally, shraddha means the place where the heart finds shelter. And as we talk about qualifications for pure devotional service, one of the things that Prabhupada will bring out is how different levels of devotees, different qualification or adhika, has different types of or strength of faith. Okay, so we're going to start to read some of this and then go into details. We explore it. So this is from Nectar of Instruction, verse number five. So one should mentally honor the devotee who chants the holy name of Lord Krishna. One should offer humble obeisances to the devotee who has undergone spiritual initiation, diksha, and is engaged in worshiping the deity, and one should associate with and faithfully serve that pure devotee who is advanced in undeviated devotional service and whose heart is completely devoid of the propensity to criticize others. So at a high level, Prabhupada is giving, or rather Rupa Goswami in this verse, is giving this understanding of the different levels of devotees. But then there's a lot more to it. And Prabhupada, as we go through the purple to this um, verse five, Prabhupada will start to talk about the qualifications of these different devotees. So he'll talk about the qualifications in terms of their faith. We'll also explore through Jaiva Dharma and maybe some of the points in Prabhupada's purple, we'll talk about the qualifications in terms of Shastra understanding. And then we'll also touch upon some things around conduct. Okay, so three things, faith, fact, so Shastra, understanding of Shastra, and then also conduct, how they behave, in order to get a, a good sense of what these different levels are. And as we read at the beginning, so that we can understand better where we are, how other people are, so that we can associate more effectively in order to make spiritual progress. Okay, so we're going to start by reading a few things that Prabhupada writes in this purple, and we'll also um, reference Jaiva Dharma in terms of some of the qualities or qualifications of those who are considered to be 
Kanishta Adhikari. So this is the purple to verse five. The Kanishta Adhikari is a neophyte who has received the Harinam initiation from the spiritual master and is trying to chant the holy name of Krishna. One should respect such a person within his mind as a Kanishta Vaishnava. So it's interesting, this idea of respect and how it's done. I had a conversation recently with a good friend of mine who's based in America, and he brought up a very interesting point. Because we were talking about glorification of devotees, but he made an interesting point. He says also we should be careful to evaluate how much glorification can a person accept. So Maharaj explained very nicely how we should not praise anyone, we should not glorify anyone, but he did also go on to explain that we may sometimes um, encourage someone through you know, appreciation, etc., which is helping them to move forward in their spiritual life. One of the reasons why the Kanishta Adhikari is respected within the mind is so that we do not trigger more false ego. We do not create more of, a, of an artificial sense of where the person is. So we actually help them to also develop those cultivate or rather cultivate those qualities that will help them to make proper progress on the, on the journey of bhakti. Even in the, in the modern world, we have this understanding that pride comes before a fall. So when there's too much pride, when there's, when there's essentially, when there's essentially a disconnect between my understanding of reality, my understanding of my own position, that becomes the beginning of real challenges. And it's interesting because those challenges are not just challenges for devotees, literally anyone whose system of understanding, whose belief system does not correlate to reality sets themselves up for some real difficulties in life. There are, there are different ways to understand anxiety or trauma. One of the ways in which we can understand anxiety or trauma is when our belief system does not actually, um, is not consistent with the reality. We, we say that someone is in denial. Uh -huh. They're in denial of the facts. They're in denial of the reality. And so literally what happens in life is that we, we have an understanding or a belief. It's different to the truth. And therefore, at some point, we have a collision. Our understanding becomes challenged by the facts. Okay. So the more that we cultivate a deeper understanding, the more that we're able to move into a way of seeing the world, which is very, very accurate. And therefore, it allows us to navigate that understanding better. I'm going to read more what Prabhupada says about the Kanishta Adhikari. So, in, in the, this same purple, Prabhupada writes, a person who is very faithfully engaged in the worship of the deity in the temple, but who does not know how to behave towards devotees or people in general is called a Prakrita Bhakta or Kanishta Adhikari. And then Prabhupada will go on to say, one, one therefore has to raise himself from the position of Kanishta Adhikari to the platform of Madhyam Adhikari. Now this is interesting. So this again gives another clue, this conduct. Not knowing how to deal with people properly. And beneath that is the system of understanding. Because everything we do is based upon the philosophy. Everything we do is based upon under, an understanding. If I have the wrong evaluation and I'm not careful, then due to that wrong evaluation, I then interact wrongly with a particular individual. And then that can lead to other outcomes or effects. So a second, uh, another symptom of this Kanishta state, and Prabhupada will also refer to it as Prakrita Bhakta, which is a very interesting word. Prakrita, and Prabhupada translates it as that, he calls it a materialistic, a materialistic devotee. And in, um, in one place, Prabhupada writes that they are on the threshold of devotion, which is a very interesting terminology. So imagine that you are, you're coming from Mexico and you want, to, you want to enter into America, okay? So you're on the border. You're on the border. You've come from Mexico. Your aspiration is America, but you're on the border. Okay, so the, on the threshold of that new country or that new particular place. So literally the Kanishta Adhikari is in that space. We are coming from the material world. We're on the border of the spiritual culture. We're looking towards that. The aspiration is there.
but we still have so much of the acculturation and the habits of our previous situation. So it's an aspiration, but we're not yet fully immersed in that new environment, in that new situation. So we will be learning a new culture. Okay, let's move on to some other points that Prabhupada makes, and then we will dive into some points from Bhakti Notakur in Jaiva Dharma. So here also Prabhupada speaks about the faith of a Kanishta Adhikari. One whose faith is soft and pliable is called a neophyte. But by gradually follow, following the process, he will rise to the platform of a first class devotee. Everyone begins his devotional life from the neophyte stage. But if one properly finishes chanting the prescribed number of rounds of Harinam, he is elevated step by step to the highest platform, Uttama Adhikari. Now this is really important. So these are stages that all of us go through. But how we progress the speed at which we progress is not, just, is not really due to the amount of time we're around. It's really due to application. So, you know, a, a student enlists at Cambridge University. So it's a top university, very good facility, very good resources. Everything is available for the student. But the question then becomes, how does the student take advantage of what's available? What does that student do during those many years within the educational institution. And we know this, different students do different things. You have some students who are in the classes physically, but their mind is elsewhere. They're thinking about previous activities. They're thinking about what they're gonna do when they leave class. There's a, there's, so that's one type of student. You have another student in the, in the class and they are very attentive, they're very um, focused, they're making notes, they're asking questions. There's another student, they're doing all of these things, but they also, interestingly enough, they build up a relationship with the teacher. They build up the relationship with the teacher. Outside of the class, they're asking other questions. They're taking full advantage of all the academic papers. So even within the educational institution, there's a wide variety of behaviors that different people are, are indicating. And those different behaviors indicate different levels of application. So sometimes, let's be very honest, sometimes people come to Krishna consciousness and they may have a bad experience. And sometimes they may have a bad experience from someone who they consider has been around for a long time. And, and often the question becomes, but they've been around for X number of years, how could this happen? Okay, but that's not exactly our philosophy. Our philosophy is, is that it's not just about the number of years, it's about what was done, how was one applying oneself during that particular period. So these are some of the things that we read about in terms of the Kanishta Adhikari. This is really the key point is that by different levels of application, different levels of practice, one makes different levels of progress. And it has a lot to do with also who we associate with. So as we think about the different levels, as we understand who we associate with and how we associate, the, the real exciting thing about this is that with proper understanding, we can better apply ourselves to Krishna consciousness. And with proper application, we can move better towards the goal. So, so think about this as, as a universal model. Marge touched upon this. By proper sambandha gyan, proper understanding that's applied, not just, not just something we read in the books and then we go away and do, do something different. But when it's understood properly, sambandha gyan, then when it's applied properly, abhideya, then we become more expertly able to accurately see and attain the goal, prayogena. Okay, so we're going to go into some further points about the Kanishta Adhikari. Now, this is from Jaiva Dharma, which has been written by, by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So he says here, a Prakrita materialistic devotee does not purposefully study the Shastra and try to understand the actual standard of pure devotional service. Consequently, so interesting, because of the lack of Sambandha Gyan, he says, consequently, he does not show proper respect to advanced devotees. He may, however, 
follow the regulative principles he has learned from his spiritual master or family tradition and worship the deity in the temple. He's, con he's to be considered as being on the material platform, although he is trying to advance in devotional service. Then he goes on to say, such a person is a Bhakta prayer or Bhakta Abbas, a neophyte devotee, for he is but a little enlightened about the Vaishnava philosophy. One who worships the deity of the Lord with faith, but neither respects the created living creatures of the Lord, nor worships and serves his devotees with devotion, is a Prakrita Bhakta. It's interesting. So we also see this in our institutions sometimes. So in the neophyte stage, there is great reverence and respect for the spiritual master and reverence and respect for the deity. But the, the lacking is the lacking in the proper treatment of the other devotees. And Bhakti Notakul says here, even other living, other created living creatures. So he's actually saying they don't treat both classes. They don't treat the non-devotees properly. And Maj touched upon that. But they also fail to treat the devotees properly. And it's not necessarily that one has been around for a long time, therefore their conduct is good. So we should be careful and wise to be empowered. Krishna's instructions have a potency. We can be empowered by the instructions to navigate the association of devotees more expertly. And really that is what um, Bhakti Notako and Prabhupada is giving us. I'll, I'll go on to read, this is another point. And this is Bhakti Notako again in Jaiva Dharma, emphasizing why this, this understanding is so necessary. So he writes, both Sri Krishna and his Bhakta are purely spiritual beings. And to comprehend pure, properly their transcendental position, some Bandha Gyan or knowledge of the interrelationships between Shakti, Jiva and Sri Krishna is imperative. Okay, so it, it allows us this idea, the Shastra Chakshus, it allows us to properly understand and therefore navigate where we are, what we're doing, and how we're able to move forward properly. So one other thing Bhakti Notarko says about the Kanishta Adhikari, he says, the scriptural injunctions that direct the conduct of an actual devotee are not meant for the Kanishta Adhikari, for they cannot even discriminate between a devotee and a non-devotee. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't all study. We should, but he's saying that this is how it's, it's, it's misunderstood. And this is why it brings in the point of association also. Because by association, something that has been read but not properly comprehended can be comprehended. It's a very interesting science here. So we have the Shabda. By Shabda, if we hear it, Shravanam, then we gain knowledge, okay? But the story doesn't end there. So, so Shabda, Shravanam gives knowledge. Now there's, there's something else to this. There is the, um, and this is explained by Jiva Goswami in the Sandabas. So Shabda, he says, is evidence. Now he also says evidence is Anuman, right? So Anuman means inference, but it's meant to be inference on the basis of the scripture, okay? And what do we do? We check that the inference is correct or we hear those things which are inferred from the proper authorities. And then we do something else. We do manana. So we're hearing what is being given by the authorities. We do manana. We reflect on what they've said. We inquire also. So then you've heard and you've reflected on the teachings that have come from Guru Sadhu Shastra. When we do all these things together regularly, it gives us understanding. It gives us understanding. And then we go further. We apply that understanding. This is called Nididhyasana. When we apply that understanding in our devotional service, in our interactions with the devotees, that Nididhyasana, that application, helps us to gain realization. So faith breeds faith. Bhakti breeds bhakti. When devotional service is properly understood, and properly applied through proper guidance, we actually come closer to realizing the purpose. As Maharaj said yesterday, this verse about how one who has implicit faith, implicit faith means faith to hear and apply what's been heard. In Guru and Krishna, for that person, even more of the scripture 
reveals itself because there's a, there was a seminar by Bhakti Tirtamaraj called Scriptural Study and Preaching. And he was explaining that there are so many nuances to the scripture, so many fine points to the scripture. So, in, um, so one of my mentees was looking to get married. And um, there, was a perp, there, was a, there was something he read in, in Bhagavatam, how the husband and wife should be of equal age. So he was asking me about it. And he was asking me about it because I'd sent him a conversation. It was a conversation between Prabhupada and one of his disciples. The disciple's name is Radha Vallabha. And they're discussing this point. And Prabhupada is saying that the husband should be older than the wife traditionally. So my mentee was asking me about this. He said, well, you know, you said the husband should be older than the wife. Um, you know, but, this, but in Bhagavatam, it's saying equal age. It seems that there's two different things which are being said here. How do I understand it? So there's a couple of things. It's interesting. Bhakti Notako, in his Bhakti Tattva Viveka, he says that actually we understand everything through the lens of the Acharya. Because the Acharya has assimilated all the teachings and then also explain what should be the emphasis according to the, to the current time, place and circumstance. So he gives something actually even in addition to the Shastra itself while being true to the conclusions of the Shastra at the same time. So therefore, Prabhupada, he actually did tell the devotees, he said, my purpose are more important than the verses themselves. And that's, not a, and that's not a statement of pride. It's actually a statement of humility because he's assimilated it all and explaining what the conclusions are. Therefore, Siddhanta, the conclusions of the Shastra. So sometimes things may seem contradictory, but when there's a deeper understanding, then we understand first of all, Prabhupada is right. But when it says equal age in that particular place in the Bhagavatam, it's actually talking about the age of the subtle body. And I won't go into all the dynamics of that, but the point that, but the, but the, the, the inference was that actually in some respects, women mature faster than men in terms of grahasta duties. So when there's a difference in age physically, it's, it means that there's more equality in the understanding around Grahasta duties. So the Bhagavatam has many things like that, which is why we try to understand things, not just through the process of reading, but also through the process of hearing and the process of inquiring. Now, there's something really powerful Bhakti Notakul says in this point around Shastra as well. He says that when there is a perfect marriage of Shastra with transcendental understanding, then this is called Shastriya Shraddha, faith based upon based on proper scriptural conclusions. In con and then I won't go to the last part of that, but I just want to touch upon this point. See, there's different types of faith. And it's not the case that everyone has the same type of faith. That, that's not the case. Shastriya Shraddha is where we have faith based upon scripture. There's another type of faith which Bhakti Notaka also speaks about, which is called Lokik Shraddha. Lokik Shraddha is worldly Shraddha. And even in the association of devotees, it can be the case that there may be many devotees who have faith, but it's not based upon the scriptures, but it's based upon the herd mentality, the Lokik Shraddha. Lokik means literally worldly. So there are some people, they, they have faith in something to be true, because everyone else believes it, you see? And even, even people who are in beginning stages of Krishna consciousness, much of their faith may be based upon the, the mass. So because everyone else is doing something, I will do it also. Now, of course, if what everyone else is doing happens to be correct, then they still move in the right direction, but it's not necessarily grounded in the deep understanding. The difficulty there is, if they move into situations or association where their belief or their practices are challenged, then their faith can be, their, their practice, their faith in Krishna consciousness can literally become destabilized. Right? It was interesting. I was, um, I was in communication with one devotee in America who was studying philosophy. And it's interesting, in her, in her philosophy class, the teachers is constantly attacking religious beliefs, just constantly just trashing it and giving all of these different arguments and saying it's blind faith, etc., etc. So she wrote me, it was like a three-page a free email 
with a whole range of different questions, expressing the doubts that she'd been given or the doubts that had been expressed by her philosophy teacher. And one of them, her philosophy teacher said that if, if, if there is a God who is good, then it, it, it's not compatible because that, that can't be the case. There can't be a God. Or if there is a God, he cannot be good because there's suffering in this world. And so I went back to her and I said that your teacher has an unconscious bias. You see, in many of these arguments, if you look, they're all based upon a series of presumed assumptions. Even in the material world, there's a lot of training around unconscious bias. And the understanding is that if I'm able to be more aware of my unconscious bias, then I can look at the situation more impartially and be more just in the way that I deal. So I was explaining that your teacher has an unconscious bias. I said that what you should do whenever people throw these kinds of things, you know, or, or ideas out, you should try to understand what's the underlying assumptions that they've, that they've made. And in this case, the unconscious bias or the underlying assumption is that this material world is meant to be a place where people are meant to be happy. Now, when you contrast that with our teaching, what do we say? We say that the material world is a prison. You see, we say the material world is a prison. It is, it is a place of reformation for who? For those who wanted to try to enjoy independently of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So if we start with that understanding, rather than, than the assumption that we're meant to be happy here because this is our home, it changes everything. It's just like going, it's like a prisoner in a prison who's calling the prison guards. And he's saying, um, excuse me, uh, prison guard, there seems to be something wrong here. Um, my cell, uh, the door, the door seems to be jammed. I, I, I can't seem to go out and about as and when I, I desire it. Could you, could you get the door fixed? And the prison guard's going to go back to the prisoner and say, no, no, you're wrong. There's not something wrong with the, with the door. It's designed like that. In fact, that's the very purpose of the cell. Okay? So when there's proper understanding, it changes the way that we see things. It changes the way that we perceive things and therefore the way we deal with things. See, another thing that happens when there's worldly shraddha, lokic shraddha, then, then we become devotees who, who can only be enthusiastic in Krishna consciousness when we're directly engaged with other devotees. You see? Prabhupada, he went out into the world and he was able to bring everyone to Krishna consciousness. If we don't have firm faith, then actually due to that lack of qualification, we have to be more careful in our interactions with others because that weakness of faith means that we cannot um, interact without becoming uh, shaken or disturbed or um, doubtful of our own practices, our own views, according to Guru Sadhu Shastra, and our own endeavor. So this point that Prabhupada makes about um, pliable faith, that actually is also given by, by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So he talks about the different levels of devotees according to the types of faith that they have. And he uses this term for the Kanishta Adhikari, he says they have Komala Shraddha, very pliable faith. So it can be easily adjusted or uprooted by those who are more materialistic. Okay. So let's see if there's anything else we're going to read about the Kanishta. Okay. So I'll read one last thing. This is again from Javadharma. So the Kanishta Adhikari, although he is at the doorstep of Bhakti, he lacks a proper grasp of Sambandha Gyan, thus he is deprived of Shuddha Bhakti. That's, that's directly stated by Bhakti no Thakur. So just understanding some of these nuances can help us to see that if we, or as we develop the proper faith through the proper fact, the two things connect, right? The faith that's based upon scripture, as he says here, Shastriya Shraddha, that will have a huge effect in helping us to move forward. Now it's interesting also, the Goswamis also write about this. And they say that the faith that is based upon Shastra, it, it, has certain, it has certain effects. And it gives two things. One, they say it gives virya. Virya means drive and determination. So when we cultivate this Sambandha Gyan in the association of devotees, it gives us a great drive in, in our devotional service. 
right? Drive determination. We become more determined in our execution of devotional service. The other thing that the Goswami say is that Shastriya Shraddha, faith that's based upon Shastra, gives Smriti. Smriti means the ability to hold the teachings within our consciousness, right? To, to, be, to, be, to have integrity in that sense, to understand and to hold on to the conclusions of the Shastra as well. So these are some of the points which are made about the Kanishta Adhikari. We're going to go on to explain some of the points that Prabhupada writes, and we'll start on page 48 of Nectar Instruction, about the Madhyam. Okay, so the Madhyam Adhikari, Prabhupada says this as follows. He says, the Madhyam Adhikari has received spiritual initiation from the spiritual master and has been fully engaged by him in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. The Madhyam Adhikari should be considered to be situated midway in devotional service. So when we're midway on, that, on, the, on the journey, that actually means that we're a Madhyam Adhikari. And then Prabhupada will go on to say that the Madhyam Adhikari is described in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.264 in this way, the translation. The Madhyam Adhikari is a devotee who worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the highest object of love, makes friends with the Lord's devotees, is merciful to the ignorant, and avoids those who are envious by nature. And then Prabhupada will go on to explain how they do this. This is the way to cultivate devotional service properly. Therefore, in this verse, Sri Rupa Goswami has advised us how to treat various devotees. Again, let's think it this through. So one of the points that are made about the Kanishta is that they do not know how to deal with people properly. And therefore, what's, what, what's implied by that is that there can be easily a tendency to interact wrongly with different people and therefore also to make offenses or not to take proper advantage of the association. So let's go on. So how to deal properly. So we can see, um, so Rupa Goswami, yeah, so let's see, this is the way to cultivate devotional service properly. Therefore, in this verse, Sri Rupa Goswami has advised us how to treat various devotees. We can see from practical experience that there are different types of Vaishnavas. The Prakritas Sahajas generally chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, yet they are attached to women, money, and intoxication. So women, again, means the opposite sex. Although such per persons may chant the holy name of the Lord, they are not yet properly purified. Such people should be respected within one's mind, but their association should be avoided. Those who are innocent but simply carried away by bad association should be shown favor if they are eager to receive proper instructions from pure devotees. But those neophyte devotees who are actually initiated by the bona fide spiritual master and are seriously engaged in carrying out the orders of the spiritual master should be offered respectful obeisances. So again, there's a difference between someone who's sincere but misguided, right? So those people, sincere but misguided, they should be given help, right? But those who actually have, a, have a, an attachment to the wrong thing, that means actually an envy, an attachment to the wrong thing. I don't want to give it up. I want to do this and I, I don't want to accept the truth. Then those people are considered to fall into the category of an envious person. So a few other points which are made about the Madhyam. So this is, um, again, the purple to nectar of instruction. One becomes qualified as a devotee on the elementary platform the intermediate platform and the highest platform of devotional service, according to this, as we said before, the development of his Shraddha. So again, we're really looking at how we develop that particular faith. And the key point is through association and through proper practice. So this is really all about how we need to deal properly and associate properly. So we have to actually remain in superior association in order to make progress okay now how do we do this how does someone for example at the beginning stage stay in the higher association so they have to do a few things so we have to avoid ingratitude right so we have to have some appreciation for the qualities of, of those who are further along the path it's interesting it's also explained that we have to control our rebellious nature 
okay so sometimes we may not <laughs> let's be very honest sometimes it, it can be difficult being in higher association because in higher association we may be checked we may be corrected i remember reading in seventh canto of bhagavatam in one purple Prabhupada talks about how one of the ways in which a devotee develops humility is by associating with superior vaishnavas so they may check us or correct us but also just their example can be humbling because they'll display a taste and an enthusiasm and an understanding which may be way beyond our own. And it, and it actually starts to help us to understand our real position. Um, so that's also there. And the other thing that allows us to stay in higher association, and Marge talked about this in, in terms of patience, is we have to tolerate the inconvenience that we feel as we experience the reactions to our offenses or anatas as well, you know? So, and the strength to do that, the strength to stay in higher association actually comes by proper chanting in the association of pure devotees. So again, through proper application of the process, a theme that comes across all of this is we derive strength. We derive increased levels of strength and that increased level of strength allows us to move forward in our progress in devotional practice. So those are some points around the Madhyam. Let me just see if there's anything else we want to read about those who are in the intermediate stage. Ah, so I'm going to read something from Bhakti Notako because he also says some key points around the Madhyam Adhikari. Okay, so this reflects the same point that Prabhupada has given. An intermediate or second class devotee called a Madhyam Adhikari offers his love to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is a supreme friend to all the devotees of the Lord, shows mercy to the ignorant people who are innocent, and disregards those who have some envy towards the Lord. And then, and then also he says, ah, and we'll read this. This is again, Bhattin Otaku and the Jaiva Dharma. The conduct of the Madhyam Vaishnavas is differently directed towards the four categories of persons. The Supreme Lord, his surrendered devotees, the ignorant materialists, and the persons inimical to the Lord or his devotees. The Madhyam Vaishnava directs his prema, transcendental love to the Supreme Lord, his maitri, friendships to the devotees, his creeper, compassion to the ignorant, and his upeksha, indifferent towards those who are envious. So those different dynamics and different dealings will allow one to come to a different level of progress, you see? So this proper understanding leads to proper conduct. Proper understanding plus, plus proper conduct leads to proper outcomes. It's like a map. Knowing where we are, knowing where we want to go, and the, and the, and the journey between those particular points. So then the last thing is, we will look at some of the qualities or qualifications of those who are Uttama Adhikari. So let's, let's explore this. Again, this is from Nectar of Instruction verse 5 in the purple so the uttama adhikari or highest devotee is one who's very advanced in devotional service an uttama adhikari is not interested in blaspheming others his heart is completely clean and he has attained the realized state of unalloyed krishna consciousness according to Srila rupa goswami the association that's the first thing and service that's the second thing of such a Mahabhagavat or perfect Vaishnava are most desirable. Okay, so we actually should be looking for such association. It's not just nice to recognize, but we should be trying to get the mercy of such personalities. Okay, I'll read a few more things and I'm gonna read to you something very interesting but that Bhakti Notako says about the different levels of potency that come from different levels of devotees. So this is a little bit more about the Uttama Adhikari. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. The word utam refers to that which is above material knowledge. Tama means the darkness of this material world, and ut means transcendental. Okay, so this utam is a very powerful point, and we, we touched upon this yesterday when we were looking at the definition of pure devotional service by, by Rupa Goswami, because he, he talks there about utama bhakti, the topmost bhakti, and therefore, naturally, utama adhikari it means that person who has the highest qualification in devotional service. So one more thing that Prabhupada writes about the Uttama Adhikari. 
Again, the purple five, the nectar of instruction. When a person realizes himself to be an eternal servitor of Krishna, he loses interest in everything but Krishna's service. Always thinking of Krishna, devising means by which to spread the holy name of Krishna, he understands that his only business is in spreading the Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Such a person is to be recognized as an Uttama Adhikari and his association should be immediately accepted according to the six processes, Dadati Pratigrananti. Indeed, the advanced Uttama Adhikari Vaishnava devotee should be accepted as a spiritual master. Everyone pos everything one possesses should be offered to him, for it is enjoined that one should deliver whatever he has to the spiritual master. Okay. So, and then this is interesting. Srila Bhaktivinoda no Thakur has given some practical hints to the effect that an Uttama Adhikari Vaishnava can be recognized by his ability to convert many fallen souls to Vaishnavism. So it's very, very interesting the way that the qualifications are given and the way that we can understand those personalities who are situated on the topmost level. But there's more to it than that, okay? And this is some interesting points that Bhaktivinoda no Thakur speaks about. So he, he briefly describes the amount of spiritual potency that um, different devotees have at different stages and what they can instill in other people. Okay, so um, the spiritual potency of a person that's shared is shared according to the level of that devotee. This again refers to what we spoke about yesterday. So we talked about becoming the medium. The more that we are able to imbibe and progress within our Krishna consciousness, the more potency that we have in order to help other people. Okay, it's not that everything is the same. So a devotee who's a prema has unlimited power and he can transfer that power to any, any person at any level, right? So any type of person. Then we have the bhava bhakta, then they can raise devotees to, to bhava and they can raise non-devotees to ruchi. They can also raise material people, materialistic people who've gained some qualification due to previous deeds to ruchi as well, just because of their, their, their potency at bhava bhakti. And then a devotee who's practicing sadhana bhakti can give non-devotees faith. So he can instill faith in materialistic people who've gained qualifications by their previous deeds. Again, this is Bhakti Notaku explaining this. Now it's interesting. <laughs> a neophyte devotee, Bhakti Notaku is saying that they can, they can awaken in devo devotion in others by the, by the other person's own piety or by Krishna's mercy but not so much by their own influence, not so much by their own power themselves. So when people come to Krishna consciousness, it is usually a, an amalgamation. It is, it is a mixture of not only the person's own sukriti, their own piety, devotional piety from a previous life, but also the influence or the power of the person who they come into contact with the devotee they come into contact with. So Prabhupada, he was told by one of his disciples, they, they, they read and they said, Prabhupada, according to scripture, it says one who has come to, de to devotional service, in their previous life, they must have performed de these different sacrifices, all of these different things, read all the scriptures, they, they, they mentioned all of these things. And they said to Prabhupada, but Prabhupada, we don't feel that we've done any of these things. So how have we come to, to Krishna consciousness? And Prabhupada basically is explained that he, he was their good fortune. He, he, he is our devotional piety. In other words, someone who's a billionaire can make you a millionaire like this. Someone who's, who's very rich and potent in their, devotional, in, in their devotional qualifications, because of their own power, they can actually, they can bring one up very, very significantly, if one has the proper mood and the proper surrender and the proper service. So, so there's two things. One is the qualification of the people that we associate with, the devotees we associate with, but, but that's one factor. The other factor is our receptivity, right? 
So the other factor is how receptive am I to that good association? And those two things come together. Now, there's, I want to also explain a, a, another interesting point. So even within the category of the Mahabhagavat, right, the topmost situated devotee, Jiva Goswami in his Bhakti Sandarbha, he says that there are actually three levels of Mahabhagavat. So actually within the categories, there are also subcategories. So in, the, in, the le- in terms of the Mahabhagavats, right, those who are situated in the topmost way, the first level of Mahabhagavat, the highest level, is that devotee situated within the Mahabhagavat platform who is completely free of the modes and is fully awakened to their relationship with Krishna. So that's one type of Mahabhagavat, the, the highest category of Mahabhagavat within that particular you know, category. The level below that is the Mahabhagavat who is free of the modes but has not yet realized what we call their sarup, their, their spiritual identity. And then the third level of Mahabhagavat, the lowest level, according to Jiva Goswami's Bhakti Sandarbha, is the Mahabhagavat who is just slightly tinged by the modes, right? It has the slightest tinge of the modes. And um, the example that Jiva Goswami gives regarding that particular level of Mahabhagavat, he gives the example of Narada Muni, right? Not, not because Narada Muni is given us as in, more than one, in more than one category of Mahabhagavat, but in the, at the point where Narada Muni received the vision of the Lord, he saw the Lord, but briefly, and actually it's interesting, the Lord referred to him as Kuyogi, right? And, and the prefix ku is actually a derogatory term. But the Lord has basically told him, carry, he said, you will not see me again in this lifetime, but carry on your practice. And what was the fault of Narada Muni at that particular point? So he was attached, just slightly attached. Why? He was attached to the peace of being in the forest. So the slightest tinge, right? That slight tinge of the mode of goodness. So Jiva Goswami gives us one of the examples or within the three examples or three levels of the Mahabhagavat. Um, so in summary, there's these different types of faith. There's faith, but there's faith based upon Shastra, and there's faith based upon Lokik Shraddha, the, the faith that comes just by being part of the crowd. So it's interesting. In, in terms of social media, for example, oftentimes something will go viral. That means that many people will follow something. And one of the biggest things they do in social media is they they like to display numbers. Because the idea is that if everyone else is saying that something is good, it must be good. So the more that numbers someone racks up, the more that other people will also join that particular bandwagon. So it it refers to this same idea, this idea of Lokik Shraddha. So it's based upon the type of insecurity. And, and it's sometimes in the, in the modern world, they call it herd mentality. Everyone else is doing something, so I should also do it. But the faith based upon Shastra is different, right? And it has a different quality, and it leads to a different outcome, okay? So we're trying to actually come to that deep, deeper type of faith. And we're coming to it through proper hearing, proper association, and even proper chanting. Because Vidya Vadu Jivanam, right? So the, the chanting itself helps to purify us. Unless we become purified, we're able to understand things more deeply, even when we read. We're able to appreciate the teachings in a, in a more powerful and in a deeper way, which allows us to fully take shelter of the teachings and make greater, more powerful in advan- advancement in our journey to Krishna. So in summary, the three types of devotees, the Kanishta Adhikari, I'm a devotee, no one else is a devotee, right? Or I'm a devotee, my guru is a devotee, but no one else is a devotee. The Madhyam Adhikari, discrimination, okay, I'm a devotee, I'm a, I'm a devotee of the Lord, and these people are not devotees of the Lord. The Uttama Adhikari is very interesting. The Uttama Adhikari's mood is, everyone else is a devotee except me. They, they, in, in this mood of deep humility, they feel literally that everyone else is a devotee except me. Now, we've explained Kanishta, we've explained Madhyam, we've explained Uttama, but there's something else, right? 
we've explained these three, and then there's Prabhupada's example. Prabhupada's example is very interesting. So Prabhupada is an Uttama Adhikari. As Maharaj said so nicely, he actually told you know, his own disciple that he was in the spiritual world with Krishna. Krishna told him, I would like you to go to the material world and preach. And he didn't want to come. He didn't want to come. But because Krishna asked him, he came. So Prabhupada is an Uttama Adhikari. However, externally, he would act as a Madhyam, which means he would actually, he would, by his own example, show that sense of discrimination. Right? Now, it's a very interesting point. So you have the Uttama Adhikari, who is actually in that mood that everyone is a devotee except me. So they're asking that everyone, please give me devotion to Krishna. I would like to become a devotee of Krishna. But then you have the Uttama Adhikari who acts as a Madhyam. So he has the potency of an Uttama Adhikari, but the conduct, the external conduct of a Madhyam. So he can serve as a spiritual master, so he can discriminate, so he can guide others. Now, one of the very interesting things when you have an Uttama Adhikari who's acting as a Madhyam is that you still can understand that he's an Uttama Adhikari because even though he's acting as, a, as an intermediate devotee, he carries the potency, he still has the potency of the Uttama, right? And that potency is demonstrated in his ability to deliver many, many people and literally draw people of all different backgrounds, and different types of personality to appreciate and to dedicate their life to the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So these are some reflections on the importance of these, these different types of qualification. How to understand this, how to also understand the significance of the, um, of the teachings and the importance of cultivating this Sambandhagyam. One must have it. Right? Whether it's through hearing from proper authorities, reading, usually it's the mixture of both, but one must have that in order to progress properly. And one must have the association of devotees who are more advanced than ourselves in order to raise our devotion to a higher level. So let me just think if there's anything else I want to share. Okay, one other thing I'll share before we open up the questions. So there's a very interesting point which relates to this, um, the, the, the teachings of Krishna consciousness. A question was asked to one devotee. And, and the question that they were asked is, we sometimes see that we meet people and they're very intelligent, very capable, um, very you know, able people, but they cannot appreciate or understand our, our philosophy. How is that possible? Because they're intelligent. And, and a very good answer was given. The answer that was given was that intelligence just means that someone is good at processing whatever limited information that you give them, okay? So you can have someone who's materially very, very intelligent, but the conclusions that they've drawn about life are wrong. In espionage, they sometimes do this. Sometimes in, in an endeavor to mislead a particular government, a particular country, a particular group of people, what will happen is information will be fed to someone. They won't be told the conclusion. They'll just be fed certain types of information, right? They'll be fed specific information with the, with the express understanding that I know that this person's intelligent. So if I give him this fact, this fact, and this fact, he will, he will process them all together and he will come to the conclusion that I'm manipulating him to come towards, okay? So they're being misled. They're being given, you know, it can be like, it can just be like, you know, there's, there's a couple who are in a, in, a, in a marriage and there's a falling out, okay? And both of them are blaming the other person. And so they go to you and they're talking about the relationship, but they don't tell you anything that they did wrong. They just give you their side of the story. They give you just enough so that when you process what you've been told, you come to the conclusion that they want you to come to, which is that the other person's at fault. But when you speak to the other person and you get all the facts, you may come to a different conclusion. So the issue isn't exactly the intelligence. It's what is the knowledge that the intelligence is being exposed to, okay? So that's why 
we, we talk about this differentiation. It's what, what, you know, intelligence means that someone's good at processing whatever information you give them. So then it's important that we process the right information. Because if we process the right understanding, if we, if we get the right understanding, process it properly, check the conclusions, then we will actually understand things properly and we will move forward. And it's interesting also that the, so in, in Descartes' understanding, so Descartes was a very famous philosopher. He came to this conclusion, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, okay? So that was the only thing he, he considered that this fact is self-evident. So it's the foundation upon which all the other things that I decide must be true. But our starting point, our starting point in terms of our understanding about the world, as we said yesterday, the perception is based upon different modes. So someone in the mode of ignorance may think that I can be happy just by being lazy and sleeping and not doing much, right? So I'm having an easy life. Someone in the mode of passion, their starting point is that I'll be happy if I just attain more material things. Someone in the higher mode, they understand that happiness means that I have to actually understand the purpose of life and act towards that purpose. So what is considered self-evident is actually different according to different modes of material nature. And that is again why it's so important to receive understanding from higher sources, right? Because then the understanding that we have will not be based upon a bias that comes from different modes. So, so in, in summary, faith, shraddha, right? Faith is what we, we're trying to, to, to develop, to cultivate. That faith should be based upon proper fact, shastra, okay? So faith plus fact, right? Faith based upon the proper fact leads to fearlessness. Yeah. It's interesting that the, the way that we, that we um, honor Prabhupada, his title, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, so Abhi Charan, Ebe Charanara Vinda, one who is literally fearless at the lotus feet of Krishna. It is, there's a hidden science in, in, within our tradition. Prabhupada says, a, a fool remains hidden until they speak. What that means is the thought pattern, the, way, the person's mentality is also demonstrated by the way the person speaks. So when we read the purports of Prabhupada's books, when you're reading those purports, you're coming into the association of the thought pattern of a pure devotee. You're coming into contact with the thought pattern of an individual who is literally fearless at the lotus feet of Krishna. So when we engage in that contact on a regular basis, as we said, we are what we associate with. We also start to develop those qualities in exactly the same way that by being in touch with fire, we start to experience the heat and the light of the fire. Right? And that's not a small thing. See, even the Bhagavatam itself makes a similar point. It says that by regular hearing of the Bhagavatam, literally the lower modes are destroyed. Right? Literally, it says every, everything, you know, inauspicious in the heart will literally be destroyed right almost completely destroyed so it is that association important association engaged with it with proper conduct proper appreciation that appreciation is coming from hearing guru sadhu shastra and it, it nourishes our shraddha right it nourishes our faith and literally the journey back to prema is a journey of intensified, increased, and purified faith. Okay, so at that point, we'll stop there and we'll take some time for comments, questions from the organizers. Unless, actually, I, I forgot we do have our seniors on the line. So let me first of all ask if our seniors would like to, you know, say, share anything. So, so he's on the Sachinana Maharaj, Vishaka Mataji, Sundarananda, anyone else would like to make any comments?
And if not, then what we will do is we will open up for questions. Uh, Question can, you hear, can you hear me? Yes. Are you well? Can Very you good. hear me? Yes, we can hear you, much. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, and uh, chapter 9, verse number 3, Prabhupada talks about three divisions of faith based on Shastra third class according to one's understanding of Shastra and how that uh, is determined by the association of of purpose persons to challenge that that their faith by presenting knowledge which is contrary to what they know so you want to say something about that how that that also as a division of faith based on shastric understanding so and feel free to correct me much from wrong but to my recollection when there's when there's a deeper understanding one is able to defeat opposing arguments when there's a lesser understanding, then opposing arguments or material arguments causes one to, to become doubtful of their own understanding and also to submit to a more materialistic view of the world and the view of life. So when there's a greater degree of understanding, one has more conviction and one is also able to explain with, with clarity and with conviction in a way that's very clear to other people what the actual um, Siddhanta or what the teachings actually are. So that's my understanding, but Marge, feel free to um, to add to or correct. And then the highest is that they can defeat all opposing arguments. The middle one is that they can't defeat it, but they're not, they're not deterred from their practice. Marge, you're cutting out, we can't hear you so clearly. And the low defeated, and they actually are believing of what they're being challenged for. So yeah, there's three types of reactions that come according to the three levels of faith based on shastra. So how does that mm, correlate with the type of faith you were mentioning, in terms of the practice of devotional service? Well, is it the same, or is there some di some distinction based on certain characteristics and? No, I think it's the same actually. I was I was looking at um, I was looking at Shuddha Bhakti Chintamani, just to kind of get some notes, and I think it correlates to the same in terms of the Uttama can defeat all opposing arguments. The Majjhim will be will be undeterred, but the but the Kanishta, their doubt because their faith is Komala, then it's ten, then there tends to be more a sense in which they may be swayed by opposing arguments. That's my understanding. And these different levels of faith, is that determine what level of practice they're on also in terms of the different stages of bhakti? Yes, yes. I don't recall the specifics of that, but, but each of the different levels, actually Kanisha will, will, will be within, certain, within a, certain, a certain range of the different stages of the journey from Shraddha to Prema. The Majin will be within a certain stage and then the Uttama is also at a certain stage, but I don't have to hand the specific details of that at the moment. But maybe Marge, if you if you have them and would like to share them, feel free. Not exactly. I, I haven't been able to read anywhere how that division is made according to these three types of devotees. It, it, it is there. Um, I, it's, actually, it's mentioned, but, um, but I've not, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't have the notes to hand. Well, you can say that, you know, you can say that you can say that neophyte devotee is still neophyte devotee is still struggling with an art of vritti, yeah. Yeah. and uh, maybe you can, uh, probably the uh, madhyama arkarya is more on the problem of nishta, yeah. Yeah. because that's a big division between those two stages, nishta and, and uh, an art of vritti, because an art of vritti, uh, uh, one can only reach nishta when and uh, as Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, 75% of one's anarthas are destroyed. Then they can move forward to the platform of nishta. So, on that, but then there's nishta in different. There's difference. There's nishta in different ways. There's the nishta in faith. There's nishta in in the practice of one's execution of devotional service. And there's also nishta in one's relationship with Krishna. So uh, I think they all come in a, 
in in the practice of the one who's on the platform of nishta is pretty much uh, reaching the platform or is on the platform of the second class devotee in fact i read that the word kanishta kanishta adhikari the, the prefix can means to seek so when we say that someone is a kanishta adhikari they have the qualification to seek nishta they ah. Yeah, they're, 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 they're in pursuit of, of that particular platform. Yeah. yeah. So that would cover up to an uh, art in the Vritti then. Absolutely. Yeah, I did read that. Good. That answers that nicely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any, any other comments, Bishaka Mataji, um, Sundarananda, if there's anything you'd like to add, feel free to do so. Krishna Prabhu, um, just wanted to share a slide. Uh, on my screen, which I was uh, lecturing to uh, non devotees, and that sort of you can see there are three zones here, and this is pertaining to the current COVID situation. And you can almost map the Kanishta, Madhyam, and Uttam Adhikari to that. <laughs> That's it. I can't see a slide. You, you will see it in a minute. Oh, I've seen this. Okay. So, <clears throat> can you see the slide? So, the inner zone is the fear zone, mm -hmm. which is where. Uh, you know, people are grabbing everything. They're just so fearful of the whole situation. What will happen to me? All the messages they're receiving. Then there's a learning zone that, okay, I start to give up what I can't control. And then finally is that the growth zone. And it says I practice um, patience, relationship and creativity, and I can share my talent and knowledge. So I think that's uh, effectively the same as the um, tree of life model. And it pertains to the current day of uh, what you've been so beautifully explaining about the, the three types of adhikaris. And we have to go from fear to learning to growth to be able to give out. And, um, and that's, you put Krishna consciousness into it, it merges it so well with this, um, this slide. So just wanted to share that. Thank you, Prabhu. Would anyone else like to say anything? Mama Vishaka, feel free to share anything that you would like to. not we can go to questions okay so then i'm going to go to the organizers feel free to uh, to begin the questions thank you prabhu we have tons of questions flowing in for you i think you're going to be busy <laughs> <laughs> so the first question was related to what you've just spoke about and it's about does the Madhyam Adhikari have the responsibility to help bring a Kanishta Adhikari to the Madhyam level? But the Kanishta is said to not know how to treat people. Mm -hmm. So should that be up to the Uttama? Okay, um, I think, can you say that? Say the question again. Too many, <laughs> too many assumptions in the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's say, that, say it again and let's go through this. Step by step. Yeah, I'll, I'll say it slowly again. Does the Madhyam Adhikari have the responsibility to help bring a Kanishta Adhikari to the Madhyam level? Okay, well, let's, let's pause there. The first thing is, see, if we, if we look at what Bhaktivinoda Thakur says in the Jaiva Dharma, the Madhyam Adhikari, he does give creeper to those who are sincere and want to progress. But that's the point. The point is actually, Let's put it another way. In spiritual life, every one of us has to take responsibility. It's always important in spiritual life to not have the mood that someone else has to do something for me. If I, if I, if I always think it's my job to do the best that I can to make progress and to take advantage of good association. So the orientation is really, what can I do? How can I serve properly? How can I be in good association? How can I hear sincerely? That should be the primary orientation. And that, that has more of a mood of taking full responsibility for my progress. So then that said, if a Kanishta who is sincere to progress approaches more advanced devotees, if they are genuinely advanced, they will actually give that creeper to that less advanced person and help that person to advance. There's, there's no question of it. So I would say that, and I'm gonna throw it out to Maharaj or anyone else if they would like to elaborate or, or give a different angle. If not, then let's take the rest of that question. The rest of the question is, 
but the Kanishta is said to not know how to treat people. Mm -hmm. So should that be up to the Uttama? So the point is, let me just add something on that point. So as, as we read, so Prabhupada writes this in Nectar of Instruction in the purple to verse 5. Everyone starts there. Okay, so the question is, it's, it's not a question of where we are in spiritual life, it's what's the direction we're heading in and how sincerely we, are we moving in that direction. So one may not understand in the beginning stages, but they are progressive in their desire to learn. And because of that, they're practicing properly, they're inquiring properly, they're hearing properly, and therefore they are increasing their qualification. Okay, and then in, in that pursuance, they'll naturally be receptive to the higher association and that higher association being compassionate will also bring them up to that higher platform as well. So that, that's how I would answer that particular point. But Marge, was there anything you wanted to add? Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then one other thing I would say is also about the Uttama Adhikari. We should all be seeking the, the highest association. So without becoming condescending, <laughs> without being negative for anyone, we should always be seeking the association. As Prabhupada rightly says, we should always be seeking the association of, of advanced devotees, especially those who are on, situated on, on the topmost platform, and to hear from and serve such persons sincerely. Uh, I also would like to add that you won't find people acting who are on that Uttama Adhikari platform, you won't find them acting on that platform. You'll act, as you mentioned, they'll come down to the second class platform. Because mm -hmm. on the first class platform, they can't, they see everyone's being more advanced than them. So what is the question of helping anybody? So although they're Uttama Adhikari, they're, they're on the second class platform who are second class and there's those who are on the second class platform who's are who are first class so then there's two kinds of madhyam advikari those who come down from the first and those who have, have attained the second class so that 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 may not be so easy to distinguish thank you much because both are acting according to those four principles mm -hmm. But you know, that's why it says in it says in the uh, nectar of instructions, one should take uh, initiation only from an uttama arikari. But then that uttama arikari doesn't stay on that platform, or else he won't be able to give initiation. He comes down to the second class platform to practice, or to discriminate, and to preach, to uplift, and to teach by example. Prabhupada was an Uttama and it was in he indicated that at the time he left the body. At the very when he was leaving the body just before he left, he said he started to apologize in a very humble way for speaking so strongly against everybody. <laughs> so he had that 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 at that level he was actually exhibiting his mood of Uttama Arikari just before he left. Any other questions? Okay, the next question is from Ananda Madhavadas. Buddha Bhavana Prabhu has mentioned various principles such as right association, proper knowledge, proper application of that knowledge, an impetus that can push one from Kanishta to Madhyam and further on. We also hear about self introspection and honesty with regards to our anarthas and our positions that may that may hide in our progress aid sorry that may aid in our progress good prabhu please comment on this where does self introspection and being honest with oneself fit into one's spiritual progress yeah it's it's it's, it's an underlying thing throughout so the quote that we gave from at the from Nectar of Instruction, I'll read it again because it's such a powerful point. Because we started with this particular quote from this section, and Prabhupada writes, that's it. This, so this is 
This is the last part of the, of the purport to Nectar of Instruction in the purport to verse 5. So Prabhupada writes, in this verse, Srila Rupa Goswami advises the devotee to be intelligent enough to distinguish between the Kanishta Adhikari, Madhyam Adhikari, and Uttama Adhikari. But then Prabhupada then also writes, the devotee should also know his own position and should not try to imitate a devotee situated on a higher platform. So when we have understanding, it helps us to really appreciate where we are, where other people are, and how to act properly. And that, that's introspection, right? There's introspection based upon scripture. It's not just a, a blind introspection. It's introspection using the literature and the association as like an index to see, okay, where am I on the, on the, on the, pla on the journey according to things such as faith? according to understanding, et cetera, et cetera. Even you can, as, we, as one understands, Marge quoted um, the point that when we're at Nishta, 75% of the Anatas are destroyed. That's also mentioned by Vishnath Chakravali Thakur in Madhuri Kadambini. So he's giving the, the symptoms of all the different stages on the, on the process from Shraddha, which is faith, all the way through to Prema. And one can understand where they are by the symptoms that they are consistently displaying at different stages in that, in that particular journey. So introspection is inherent to that. One thing I remember, anyway, I'll just give the point. One thing I remember hearing in a class was that as a, as a movement, and I did actually want to talk about this, so I'm glad you brought this up. We often don't take inventory. We often don't reflect on what we've heard and what it means to us as devotees. And one of the reasons for that is if our lifestyle is too passionate, then, then it does not necessarily we create the space in which we can actually with an undisturbed mind reflect on what we're hearing and reading so there's there's a trade-off when Prabhupada spoke about simple living and high thinking if we if our lifestyle is sufficiently simple and it can be different for different people different people have different psychologies but if it's if it's sufficiently simple it gives more space mentally to reflect on the teachings of guru sadhu and shastra in order to apply them more effectively in our life. So there's also something to bear in mind there. Because going back to the point that was made earlier, where there's more goodness, there tends to be more time to reflect and more an emphasis on trying to understand things properly. And Marge spoke about this earlier. You want to act, yes, but you want to act having understood things properly, which is usually a symptom or symptomatic of the mode of goodness. Does anyone like to add anything, Marge? Feel free to uh, correct, adjust uh, accordingly. If not, then we'll go to another question. Okay. Next question is from Prema Murti Das. Hare Krishna, Deya Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prema Murti. <laughs> <laughs> you were speaking how Kanishta cannot help totally new people who come to Krishna consciousness. Could you elaborate on this a little more? Yeah, it's not that they can't help. It's not that they can't help. It's that the potency, it's not the same as those who are more advanced. So everyone, but you see at the same time, by engaging in devotional service sincerely, one also increases one's spiritual, um, spiritual qualification. So we have to do the service in order to become better at the service. It's like, um, there's a saying, right? Practice makes perfect. Okay. Practice makes perfect. There is also, it's actually a very exciting thing. There are on this planet right now, there are literally millions of people who due to previous activities have some Sukriti. They have some Sukriti. They have some, some devotional credit. So sometimes it's called Agyata Sukriti. They may have unknowingly done some service for someone, right? A devotee. They may have taken prashadam. They didn't know it was food which has been offered to God, but they just took it. They may have taken it and appreciated, so they get even more benefit. And so what will happen is when the transcendental message goes out, those people who already have some credit, some sukriti, they will respond. You see, that's one side. But with the example of Prabhupada, even if the person has no sukriti, he is so powerful that in, the, in, the, in, their, in his association, as, as long as they're not offensive, they're, they're actually building, they're building spiritual credit. 
right? As long as they, they are favorable in the association of such a person, their spiritual credit is building up. Now, what's also interesting, and this is mentioned by, this is mentioned by Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the Harinam Chintamani. He explains that even if people say the syllables of the holy name, they gain some credit, you know? So if someone says Harama, for example, just because it contains some of the syllables of the holy name, they're also getting some credit. So as things build up and we reach out with a message, the two things come together and we can help people. So our job under the instructions of Srila Prabhupada is to reach out and, and to make the message not only available, that's not exactly the, the teaching, it's not only to make the message available, but to make the message available as, as nicely and as, as, as expertly as possible to as many people as possible. So, anything? Uh, there's a second part to this question. Um, I'll just ask, and you might have already answered it. The second part is, um, could you please explain to us how a proper preaching uh, with adequate approach to new people is important versus spiritual potency of the preacher? Yeah, both things are important. So one is strategy, the other is, is, is purity. Now the two, to be honest, the purity is more important. But there is, a, there is an interconnection between the two things. So Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Teisham satata yuktanam, bhajatam priti purvakam, the dadi bodhi yogam tam yenamam upiyanti te. He says, to those who serve me with devotion, I give them the knowledge or the intelligence by which they can come to me. I was thinking this morning, about the prayers that Prabhupada wrote, the prayers that Prabhupada expressed to Krishna when he was coming to the West. And he actually talked about how the people in the modern world are submerged in the modes of, of ignorance and passion. And he says to Krishna, if you like, you could empower my words, right? So that they will be able to understand these, your, your teachings, right? So there's, there's first of all that mood. The mood is actually, Krishna, I'm depending on you to do it. That's the first thing. But at the same time, there, there is also the endeavor, right? So what does Vishnath Chakravali Thakur say? He says, effort and mercy. The so effort means that we have to make the endeavor. We should try to present the teachings as, as good, as well as possible, as attractively as possible. That's directly stated by Prabhupada. That's in First Canto, Chapter 4, Text Number 1 in the purple of, the, of Srimad Bhagavatam. He, he elaborates on that there. So we have to try and present it as nicely as possible in the appropriate way for different audiences. In that purple, Prabhupada says, this is called realization. But the more that there is purity, the more that we gain a deeper understanding about how to, how to present the philosophy in a way that will be meaningful and accessible and attractive to people out of compassion for them. Okay, and, and a very good example of this is the planetarium. I was thinking about this in terms of how, what, what is Prabhupada's preaching strategy? So Prabhupada, he's brilliant. What he does is you have the substance, you have the, the purity, the pure form of transcendence, but then you also have to present it in packaging. You have to package it in a way that is going to be attractive and, and that's going to, that's going to draw the attention of people. So with the Vedic planetarium, Prabhupada actually gave many statements about how it should be designed. And so what, what is a Vedic planetarium? Many people are going to come to Vedic planetarium, not because they have any understanding or interest in anything spiritual, but they're going to come because it's a great attraction as well. It looks very beautiful. It's very opulent. So what, so what does that mean? How do we break it down? It means you take the transcendental substance and you package it in a way that's meaningful and relevant to your particular audience. I was also thinking that different preachers will often have different audiences. You'll see that there are some preachers who are empowered to really present the teachings to an academic audience. So Prabhupada established um, the Bhaktivedanta Institute and he was very excited for um, Bhakti Srup Damodar Maharaj and others to take the teachings and present it in a way that's meaningful to the scientific community. And then you have other people who are presenting in other, in other audiences. But the point is, we have the pure, the pure teachings, so that the essence remains intact, but it's presented in a way that's meaningful for a particular audience, and we do that with as much sincerity as possible, and then everything else is, is up to Krishna. 
Okay, but I'll throw that out for Marge or others who would like to maybe expand on that or add to as they wish. Mm -hmm. uh, you said it. Uh, and Shiva Ram Maharaj makes that point throughout his book, Sutta Bhakti Chintamani, when he, he talks about Adhikari or qualifications. Or, he said one has to know the audience in order to make the message relevant. So that's that's part of the concern of a preacher is to think in such a way as how to present this for a particular type of audience. And when you have a mixed audience, when you have people who are fixed in Krishna consciousness and you have people who are just beginning, you generally speak to the new people and everyone will benefit. So these are just some points on uh, can that sometimes you cannot always know exactly the audience, but that should be some endeavor prior to presenting the knowledge that you should think about it and try to evaluate how you want to present it and what type of audience you you have and sometimes that's cultural too you know you don't you just like i'll, I'll just uh we i if you're preaching to Indians in India and you're preaching to Indians in Europe and you're preaching Indians in America, you're preaching different to the three types of Indians. <laughs> this is my experience. <laughs> you know, you can't preach to Indians in, in America like you preach to Indians in India. It just doesn't work, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> in India, you see how Prabhupada preached in India. He was like, you know, like a lion <laughs> roaring. <laughs> but he wasn't like that with the with the American audience. <laughs> so yeah, so it's um, it's it requires that you know that that initial obser observation or to try to understand how best to make the audience the, the message, message relevant. I'll just add one thing to what Marge said, because I think it's it such a beautiful point. So when I was, in, um, I was in America, I think it was one or two years ago, there was a youth retreat. And it was very interesting. When we were speaking after the class I gave, what some, of the, some of the youth were, were saying that they, they, were, they were struggling with, with assimilating the teachings. And the reason why they were struggling is they said that, you know, whenever they, they, they told me they don't go to the classes at the temple. And I asked them why. And they said, because whenever we go to the class in the temple, they, always, they, they, just, they just say the same thing, right? They just say, you're not the body. In other words, it's parroted. So it's a teaching, but you, it's said the same way every time. And therefore, they, they didn't feel that sense of learning something and growing. And I was reflecting how what we're trying to do and especially if we have a mixed audience, the, if you have a mixed audience where, audience where there's new people and also people who are devotees, what you do is you give the same fundamentals, but you give them with a fresh realization. Therefore, the people who've heard the, the same fundamental points before, they, they now hear a new angle on it. So that keeps it alive for them. And the people who are new, everything's new to them. So the, same, the, the principle is new. And the illustrations of, of it's also new. So the idea is ideally we, we're, tr we're trying to constantly hear, reflect, think, and, and, and assimilate the teachings so we always have some fresh understanding that we can share with other people. And that has a lot to do with, with the regular hearing, reading, chanting, etc. So I just wanted to add that. Maybe we'll go to another question. Yes. Thank you for such beautiful answers. Please, Premamurti, gives us a thumbs up on our chat. Hare Krishna. Next question is, how should one not pursue the very person who, dis who disregard or envy the Lord? That's anonymous. I didn't understand the question. Can you, can you repeat that, please? Of course. You... Of course. Basically, she's asking that if one is disregarding the Lord or is envious of the Lord, how should we act? Should we disregard them totally? Um, I see it's, it's a little bit, there's, there's a nuance to this. You see, to be honest, there are some people in the world 
who have a negative view. There's some people who have a negative view about anything spiritual, anything which relates to God consciousness, because it's not been explained to them properly. It's been explained in a very dogmatic way. That's one type of person. So what they need, they're not, they're not averse to it per se. They're averse to it being, you know, basically shoved down their throat. You know, they're, they're averse to the kind of, if you, don't, if you don't surrender and do what we tell you, you're going to go to hell. They're averse to that kind of fear-based approach. There are some people who are averse because they, they just haven't had it explained in a way that's reasonable. Right? So they may be a bit more intellectual and it has to make sense. And we, we can do that, but maybe they haven't had that, that approach done to them before. And then there's some people who, no matter what you do and how you explain it, they just do not want to accept it. Right? Now, it's not, so the, the point that was made in Jaiva Dharma by Bhakti Notako, he says indifference. So we're, we can still be respectful in our dealings, but we understand, okay, what we, the highest thing that we have to share, this person is not ready to, to receive that gift. Okay, we understand. But what we don't do is waste all of our time and energy with someone who's not ready to receive the gift. Um, <laughs> a few years ago, what happened was um, the, the temple in London, when the devotees would go on Sankirtan, there was a specific campaign by another, by another religious institution. And they had, they had a, a specific campaign. They would deliberately go to the devotees on Sankirtan they would pretend to be interested in the books and they would engage the devotee in, 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 um, in discussion. And what they were doing was they were deliberately diverting the devotee's attention to them who had no interest in, in, in taking anything about Krishna consciousness seriously, but they were doing it so that the devotees would not reach other people who would, who would be genuinely interested, you see? So when we are trying to share, we're, the, the devotees are also strategists. We want to see how we can do the best for the best in service to Prabhupada's mission with the limited time and energy that we have. Right? So the idea here is that if you offered it sincerely to someone who isn't ready to accept, okay, but then who else can I share this gift with? Okay, while learning, okay, what can I take from that interaction? Maybe what could I do differently? How could I share this in a way which is more expert in future? But okay, this person isn't ready at this time. Fine, but who is ready? Who can I bring that good fortune to? That's how we should be thinking. Okay. Any other comments from any of the other seniors? Anything that you'd like to say on that point? If not, we'll go to the next question. Okay, the next question, I think it's a question that many of us ask ourselves and it's about association. The, so the question is from Yasmin Bright. She's asking, what can we do to acquire and develop deep, meaningful devotee association? Thank you. Very good question. Um, the first thing is that we should be that association for other people. Oftentimes, Prabhupada said, first deserve and then desire. So while we are definitely in that, in that mood where we should be endeavoring to hear from those who are more advanced in the spiritual path, we should also try to be good examples ourselves. If we ourselves are good examples of devotees who will encourage other devotees, try to assimilate the teachings ourselves so we have more to share, you know, try to be an inspiration by our example, then that will please Krishna very much, you see? And because he's pleased, that will also, that, that his, his being pleased can also result in us being blessed with very good association as well. So we should endeavor for it, but we should try to become that which I would like to see in other people and that which I would like to associate with as well. Otherwise, the danger is we may, and uh, there's one other thing. And the other thing is, is that includes being considerate and sensitive to others. Sometimes devotees are like, I want this person to be, I want this person to spend time with me, but that person may not have so much time or capacity. And then we will get angry because they're not doing what we want. That's not the mood. Yeah. The mood is association is also hearing, right? Association is also serving. So we should, we should consider all of these things. So try to go for the highest association and try to be the example, try to be the association as well. Try to imbibe the teachings more so we can share more try to inspire 
our, our current association more by being inspired in our own devotion, by being enthusiastic in our own devotion, try to learn more so that we have more to share with other people. All of these things are what we should be doing in that respect. Okay, anything else to add, Maharaj, or other seniors? Well, I was just thinking of the, uh, the six loving exchanges that's mentioned in the uh, nectar, of devotion, nectar of Instructions is one way to, you know, create the mood of, of association. Practicing those six loving exchanges, specifically giving prasadam or giving a gift like that. That opens up a relationship. Thank you, Marge. Mm -hmm. So, so there is a linked question to that. Maybe you can answer it briefly, but I think it's quite pertinent what she's asking. Um, or actually, this might be somebody else asking, but it's linked to the previous question. And they're asking if someone is envious in our devotee circle and associate in our association, what can we do? <laughs> good, good question. Um, so there's a few things. There's a few things. It depends on how much progress you want to make from situations like that. The first thing is to consider, okay, why? What is it, what, what, what is, what is triggering that envy? Because you can consider that envy it can be an indication that there's something that that person is not getting in their own spiritual life and therefore they're feeling some envy towards us. Now, of course, we don't actually have to associate with devotees who are in lower modes. Envy is symptomatic of the mode of ignorance. So we may, if that envy is quite strong and negative, we may have to keep a distance, but we can always serve the person. A person who's envious, we could pray for them. Right. We could we can also if we have to be around them, we can try and do things which are more expertly so that they feel they feel they feel appreciated and valued, which may rate, which may bring them out of that kind of lower mode. We may also look to see, am I doing something in a way that's causing or triggering envy in other people? Am I kind of flaunting something? Am I trying to am I presenting myself as if yeah, I, I'm better than you? I've got this that you don't have, etc. There are many people in the world, their sense of happiness only comes from making other people feel jealous or envious of them, right? There's many people like that. They want to show off, like, I've got, I've got something that you don't have, you know? And then they complain when people respond with envy. So we should try and consider <laughs> why, why is it that this person feels envy? What, what's within my, my sphere of control? It, well, see, um, one of the differences between a Madhim and a Kanishta is this. When the Madhim sees situations which are negative, the, the, their, their default is to look at themselves first, right? Those who are neophytes, when we, when we come across difficult situations, the tendency is to blame other people first, you know? So when there's more advancement, there's more humility. And that humility it results in, in, a, in a tendency to first think, what can I do to assist and serve that other person or to help that other person to make progress? So we have to look at that. And if, there's, and if we, we do what we can, we, we take the lesson from it because there are no accidents. But if it's something that's continuously and deeply imbibed in that person, we may have to keep a respectful distance. Anything to add, Maharaj, or, or other scenes? Prabhupada would say, if you're envious, you're in the material world, and if you're not envious, you're in the spiritual world. He made that distinction in one lecture over and over again. That's the difference between material and spiritual, is between being, and basically he said, the whole world is envious. So it's everywhere, even in devotee circles. But like you said, if, if by acting in the proper way, we can we can bring out the good qualities of that person, and that will help them, you know, get over that. Yeah, we have to be an example for what we want other persons to be. Otherwise, if we just try to change people, uh, then it's another form of pretense. Uh, they, you know, better to be an example. When we get a chance to speak, 
then we should speak but generally our example is the is the best mm -hmm. by our example we we teach people more than by our words words are important but example is higher mm -hmm. any other question yes this question also came up yesterday actually and we asked quite a few times this question is from Bhakti Priya Mataji and also I think Sri Devi Mataji yesterday raised something similar and it's to do with a seniority within the devotee community. So basically the question is, uh, please advise and clarify that if you, if someone has been in Krishna consciousness longer than yourself and they have this higher managerial position, sometimes we feel that we are mistreated by them and we we don't know how to deal with that sort of relationship maybe they are doing elevated uh, duties or services but when they are treating the ones who are not so senior in a bad way how do you deal with that situation <laughs> that's a very good question so uh, <laughs> so there's a few things. So let's, let's, let's explore this. So first of all, it may or may be that the way we perceive something is different to the way that it is or the way it's perceived by other people. And, and that's not to minimize or be lacking in compassion towards people who are mistreated. Mistreatment shouldn't happen. Okay, let's be very clear on that. But the way that I perceive a person's behavior may be different to their intention. It may be different to the way that they perceive it. And so I think with anything like that, when it's a specific case, we do, and this is, this is why there's a real emphasis in devotional service in association and, and in association preemptively. Oftentimes I've seen that there are some devotees, they do not develop that good network of association. And then when things go wrong, then they have very few people they can draw upon because they haven't built that trust already. They haven't been revealing their minds in that, in that situation or in that circle already, but that's important to do because then it gives us another perspective on what we're experiencing. And there's different ways to respond. The reason why we can't just give a, a one size fits all answer is because when we talk about mistreatment, that's a, big, that's a big category. Mistreatment can be from something small to something very, very serious, you know? So we have to, first of all, consider in the association of people that we trust who are more mature, this is how I'm perceiving it, let me get another viewpoint let me, from people again more mature mature doesn't necessarily mean just been around that that usually is the case but specifically more mature those who are further along the, the spiritual path i am especially if we have a spiritual master we can bring the concern to the attention of our spiritual master and get that guidance from that particular person and then that would decide how we proceed yep so it requires on a case-by-case -case basis that we should actually get guidance on what one. If it's someone who's more like a peer, then we may actually, in a considerate way, address the situation because then it's equals, okay? Even then, we may or may not address it directly because if the person can't hear, then maybe we will go through another avenue through a senior who actually can address that particular person, you know? So there's always room for expressing a concern within Vaishnava etiquette but the nuance as to how we address that concern is really important. When I was in America, this point came up and I was explaining to the devotees, there's three questions that we can ask generally when we have to deal with something that's concerning. So question number one, does this need to be said? So sometimes, and this is, I'm talking more broadly, sometimes it may be a devotee is doing something, you know, and they're just new, right? So they're a new devotee, they don't know that they shouldn't enter the temple in a certain way, okay? so. Question number one, does this need to be said? Question number two, does this need to be said by me? Okay, so if it does need to be said, then who is the correct person to deliver the message? Is it me or is it someone else? Question number three, does this need to be said by me now? So if it is your responsibility to address something, then it's okay, what's the right circumstance, what's the right time to have that conversation? So from what you said, if it's a senior person, we, the usual etiquette is, is that we would go to one of their peers who are mature, who we trust, we would express our concerns, and then we would take guidance 
going forward. And it may be that that peer would address it with that person directly, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, some thoughts on that. Um, Marge, anything to add? Or you know, anyone else who's seen you, anything to add? Not really. Not really, except that this happens a lot. <laughs> We see somebody acting wrongly and we have to think, is it my position? If it is, is it now? And if it's not now, if it's later, uh, how to do it in such a way as uh, it doesn't cause greater disturbance. Thank you. I mean, I face, I'm faced with that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when, if you stay inside a temple, you see people break, breaking temple etiquette constantly, only because of lack of uh, training and education. They don't know the proper etiquette for staying in the temple and how to behave in the temple with regards to paraphernalia and uh, interaction. So, uh, you know, and you'll see it if you attend the morning pro and morning and evening programs happens all the time. But if you were ready to jump every time something went wrong, you would be offensive because it's not the time to do it. And it's not the place to do it. It has to be done in, in such a right way that uh, it's not a, we're not reacting to the situation. We're thinking about how to do it in such a way that the, the effect will be, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is will be effective. <laughs> So yeah, that's a thing we we face a lot, uh, constantly. It's just happening all the time, especially when it comes to Vaishnava etiquette. Vishaka Mataji, would you like to add anything on this Vaishnava etiquette, or we can move on to the next question? We'll take the next question then. How does one not feel hopeless after identifying with Ganishta stage and thinking about one, offenses made at this stage? Shall we answer the first one before we do the second one? Yeah, well, the thing is, the point is that everyone goes through that stage. It's not bad. It's, it's like, you know, it's like saying that, you know, how do I deal with the fact that I was a baby and I, you know, I used to, you know, throw food on the floor and I, I would spill food over and I would cry. All of these things, it's, just, it's the natural stage one goes through. But the question is, it's not so much just a question of where we are, it's a question of the direction that we're heading in. Mm. So the real, the real thing is, the real thing is, the, the, the exhilaration is, the pro, is, is through the progress. So don't be fixated on where you are, but, but really focus, well, is it that there's a story from the Mahabharata? So Dronachari wanted to test the Pandavas. So they put like a, a model of a bird in the, in the tree on a branch. And he, he would call the different Pandavas over to shoot the eye of the birds. And he would ask one of them, so, you know, can you see the tree? And they say, yeah, I can see the tree. He said, all right, sit down. You're not qualified to shoot. And different ones come up. Can you see the tree? I can't see the tree. Can you see the branch? I can see the branch. Okay, sit down. You're not qualified to shoot. Another one, uh, what can you see? I can see the tree. I can, can you see, I can see the branch. I can see the bird. He said, you're not qualified to shoot. But when Arjuna came, Dronacharya asked him, Arjuna, can you see the trees? I can't see the tree. He said, can you see the branch? Can't see the branch. Can you see the bird? No. What can you see? Arjuna said, all I can see is the eye of the bird. And, and the point was that because he had such a, a strong focus on what he was trying to achieve, where he was trying to go, that, that, was, that, that indicated that he had the right mentality. So where we are is one thing. It's important to understand that so we can continue to progress. But the main thing is use that as a launch pad in order to move forward. No one will remain a Kanishta Adhikari. Mm. Every one of us will grow if we, if we follow the process. It will, it will bring us to those higher states where we can experience a deeper and richer level of Krishna consciousness. Anything to add, Maharaj or Mother Vishaka? Yeah, Prabhupada mentions in one purport that our our whole movement is situated on a Madhyaman platform. So Kanista Yadikari is just a, a, a transition stage. No one should be should want to stay there, or no one should 
uh, somehow or other remain there for whatever reason. It's, it's not a stage for practicing devotional service. It's just a transition, that's all. And sometimes it's not even a transition. People can actually come quickly through that stage and to the Madhyama platform with the proper association. Fast. Mm -hmm. Any last question? We, we can, mindful that it's now um, time, so we can take one last question if that's okay? Sure. Okay. So we have, we often expect more from those we know well, who are, who are close to us, devotees or family, when they don't meet our expectations. Mm -hmm. This often disappoints us. Mm -hmm even though we know this, we shouldn't be feeling this way. Mm -hmm. How do we avoid this sort of feeling? Change your expectations. Mm -hmm. Expectations should be based upon something higher than just what we think people should do. Because you see, if I, if I don't have proper respect and understanding of where people are and what, they, what they're having to deal with, that can be the basis. In other words, if I'm ignorant of your situation, if I'm ignorant of the other things that you're dealing with, maybe the things that you're struggling with, and then I then request you to do something and you're not able to do it, but my reaction isn't based upon, it's not based upon you exactly, it's based upon my misunderstanding. I'll, I'll tell you an example. I, um, this was years ago, I was, I was running late for a meeting. So I was running late for a meeting, I, I went to the, um, the, the bus stop near my house to get the bus, the coach, if you call it. And the bus was about to leave, but luckily, because someone pressed the, the buzzer to get off the bus, um, I, I got a chance to go on. I paid my fare. As I was walking past, the bus driver said something negative to me. And I didn't, I, I didn't hear what she said. I just knew it was negative. I went back to the bus driver. I said, what did you say? Then she started complaining. People like you, you're slowing us down. You're wasting our time. All of these different things. And I was already running late. And then I was kind of behind. And then, I, and then I was turning around and everyone on the bus was looking at me because they're looking at what the person was saying. And what was interesting is around the time that that happened, I think the weekend before, I'd given a seminar on forgiveness at ISKCON London. And I remembered, okay, now I've got, I've, got to, I've got to practice while I preach. I went back to the bus driver and I actually said to the bus driver, says, I'm sorry if I've offended you in any way. Now, what was really interesting is at that point, the bus driver then said, she apologized to me. Then she explained what had been happening for her in that day. So she explained, and maybe some of you will be familiar with this, sometimes the people who drive the buses, people will be rude to them, they'll shout at them or they'll swear at them, that's one thing. So she'd had a few instances like that on that day. Then they had a schedule, so if they don't reach each, each bus stop at the right time, then their manager gives them a hard time that they're not, they're not moving to schedule. So that was a stressor for her. And then the other thing is I believe the company was going to make redundancies. They were going to let, they were going to remove some people from the, from the company because they, they need less staff. So she was fearful for a job. By the time she explained everything that was going on, I understood exactly why she kind of just snapped. It wasn't personal. It was, there was a whole range of other circumstances going on in her life that she was struggling to deal with. And I often think about that sometimes when we feel disappointed by people it's often because we have the wrong expectations we don't know the full context and to be honest with you, you know, now the question can become well why didn't they tell me but then that's also a question maybe that they didn't feel comfortable sharing with us some of the other challenges that they were going through which is why they couldn't come through in the way that we expected so there's a there's a famous saying it's kind of like from a, a kind of um, personal development teacher and he says seek first to understand Seek first to understand, right? So I remember we discussed this with Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj once. He said that what you do, actually was my god sister, she asked him about this. He said, what you do is you approach the person and you say, probably from my perspective, this seems to be the issue, right? If you have the relationship, if it's appropriate, because then you're not attacking the person, but you are having an honest conversation. You're, you're revealing your mind. So Prabhu, I mean, in this situation, I expected that you would respond in this way, 
but instead you responded in that way. Please help me to understand, you know, why you chose to respond in the way that you did. I'd like to understand, you know? So it's a very mature, a very mature way of approaching a situation so that there's an honest and open communication. If these people are people who are juniors or, or peers, it may not necessarily be the approach you will take with a senior, depends on the relationship, but that's one thing that you can do, to try to seek first to understand. And we have to consider, is my expectation, is my expectation actually based upon something other than just what I would like them to do? Is it, is it the right expectation? And I would, I, would, I would even go so far as to suggest that if the person consistently doesn't come through, then that may be a sign that my expectations need to change in, re in relation to that person. Mm. Okay. Nice. Would you like to add anything, Marge? That was excellent, wonderful, wonderful answer. Perfect example. Couldn't have been said any better. Thank you for blessing us to speak properly then. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful answer. We have more questions, but we can leave them for tomorrow for our Q&A. So thank you, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, thank for you all. all your nectar. Thank you, Maharaj, always. So if we can just say three hurry balls to Buddha Bhavana Prabhu and His Holiness Chandramuli Maharaj and senior disciples.